All right, top 10 sins and struggles. This is lesson number nine. Uh, and so we begin with a countdown of our top 10 sins and struggles according to the surveys that we have taken. Here's our list so far. Number 10, laziness. Number nine, anger. Number eight, cursing and gossiping. They came in together. Number seven, pride. Number six, neglecting church. Number five, coping with, uh, uh, coping with change. Also coping with conflict. Those two were tied. When I say tied, we had as many people mention that as a particular issue as the other. Uh, number four, easily discouraged. Number three, and that's tonight's lesson, over anxious or worry, dealing with worry. And uh, if you notice, interesting, another struggle issue. You know, we said the top 10 sins and struggles, so laziness, anger, cursing, gossiping, pride, neglecting church, those are in the sin category, and then coping with change. That's not necessarily, necessarily a sin, but obviously it seems to be a struggle with a lot of folks. Coping with conflict, same idea, easily discouraged, another struggle issue. And number three, over anxious, another struggle uh, issue here. Um, worry all by itself is not a moral issue. Although in one sense, when we as Christians worry, we are disobeying Jesus who said not to worry. Don't worry, he said, don't be anxious. So you know, when he tells you don't do something and you go ahead and do it, well, it's kind of a sin, isn't it? But it's not a moral thing. You know? It's not like uh, you know, fornication or stealing or things like that. But it is a problem and it does cause problems in our lives and and many times can lead to a loss of faith. So it's a kind of a dangerous thing. Of course, that this struggle was named by so many people is no surprise uh, because it has always been a common human reaction by both believers and non-believers. If I gave the same, you know, if I gave the same uh, 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 survey to people who are not church people and they didn't call sin, sin, you know, I, we just call you know, your top 10 problems, let's just say, and, and, but we had the same thing. Um, uh, 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 dealing with worry would, usually is at the top. I've done this several times and worry is always in the top five. So it's something very common. It's not just us here in this particular place. It's something that all people uh, struggle with. Um, so tonight we're going to look at this issue and uh, as always uh, there are no easy fixes but hopefully you know, surface some Bible ideas that, that we have to be able to deal with this uh, particular thing. So let's start. So what, you know, what are we dealing with here? What is worry? Well basically it's a feeling. You know, if, I had to, if I had to boil it down to a most simple thing, what is worry? It's a feeling. It's a feeling of fear or unhappiness regarding someone or something. Because worry is not a good feeling, right? We don't feel good when we're worried. So what, what is exactly, if you're trying to name the feeling, I would say it's a feeling of fear. Some say with anxiety perhaps. It's not a happy thing. Usually it's a negative speculation about something that may happen in the future. Because the things in the past, we don't worry about the past, we regret the past. That's the feeling we have about the past. We, we regret the past or we feel guilty about the past. You know, oh, I sh you know shoulda, coulda, woulda, you know, I shoulda done this, I, sh I shouldn't have done that. You know, the, that's how we feel about the past. But when it comes to worry, we don't actually worry about the past, we worry about the future. And here's the interesting thing, we worry about the future whether it's one minute from now or one week from now or one year from now. But the thing about worry is it's always forward. It's always you know, ahead of us. That's, that's what drives worry. And what do we worry about? Well, you know, health, family, security, right? What are most of the prayers about? People you know, offering prayer about health, you know, all the things we're reading about. Young people want to stay healthy, Older people want to stay as healthy as long as they can. We worry about family, the crisis is in our family. Can we take care of our family? There's a, div there's a division in our family, you know, whether it's husband, wife, children, whatever. We worry about security. Those are the top three, health, family, security. 
We're able to worry about something or anything that we focus our negative speculation on. So you know, to worry about family, well, you'd say, well, you know, family's important. Or worry about our health. Well, health is important. You know what they say, if you're not healthy, you just can't enjoy anything else, right? You can be a billionaire, but if you're not healthy, what good is it? So those things are normal to worry about, those big things. But we can worry about the smallest things. We can worry about having a good hair day on the right day. Of course, that's not one of my worries, but you know what I'm saying? For those of you who still have your hair, I mean, people worry about stuff like that. They worry about their reputation. They worry about, hey, they worry about their car being driven by their children, Paul. And if their car will come back to them in the same condition that it left the house in. You parents who have children who drive your cars know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm being a little facetious here, but you know, we can worry about a lot of stuff if we just focus on it, right? Now there's a difference between worry and concern. It's not the same thing, worry and concern. Concern is focused attention. Concern is a good thing. You know, I mean, uh, if I'm a student, and my exam is coming up in two weeks, I don't have to worry about it, but I, it's a good thing if I am concerned about it, if I focus my energy, you know. So we have to make a difference. Um, I've often said to God in my prayers, Lord, I'm not worried, I was just wondering <laughs> if this is going to happen. So focused attention or concern, that's like a good thing. You got to take care of your business. Focus concern about your health. Your weight's not right, you're going to take care of that. You, know, you get a blood test, whoops, too much sugar in the, whoa, you, you need to cut down on the soda pop or whatever. That's focused attention and that's okay. Uh, but worry, however, is destructive. So uh, let's think for a moment. What does worry accomplish? You've always heard this, people say this. Well, what, you know, what does worry accomplish? Well, let's think about that for a second. What does worry accomplish? Well, worry, produces absolutely nothing except overstress. That's the only thing that worry produces. The only tangible thing that it produces is overstress, not just stress. Everybody needs stress, you know, like the adrenaline's running because you got to work, you got to do this, you got to take care of the kids, you know, the, that's okay. Overstress is when the needle's in the red, you know what I mean, and you're getting close to burnout. Well, worry produces but you know, like there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Well, worry produces bad stress, overstress. Worry also saps us of energy. People who are worried all the time don't have a lot of energy because so much of their emotional energy is sucked up by their worry. It wastes time. It's discouraging. It robs us of enthusiasm that we need to spend on, on positive things, positive projects. You know, worry takes up time. All that, all that stuff going around in your brain that you're worrying about, that, that eats up the clock. We worry about tomorrow, but we have no idea what tomorrow will bring. Now we can assume, oh well, tomorrow, I know what tomorrow will bring, I'll get up, uh, I'll go to work and I, I know I have these things that I need to do and I'm meeting Susie for lunch. You know, like we kind of have our plan for tomorrow. But do we really know what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, no. You know, I mean, I use Paul as an example. Just a couple of weeks ago, his day was planned. I get up real early because I've got to go to the yard to pick up a truck or something like that. I got my lunch, I got my day planned out, blah, blah, blah. Except at the corner of, uh, uh, of Douglas and 29th, the car pulls out and totals his car. And could have killed him on the spot. That wasn't planned for. He didn't know that was going to happen. He didn't know. So we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And of course, that day was completely different than what he had planned it to be. So we worry about tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. If we did, 
we could do something about it and change worry into action, but we don't. So we waste energy and time worrying and we create unneeded stress and that unneeded stress leads us to burnout. Now here's the thing. We know all of this. Nothing I've said to you, you don't already know. We know all of this, but we continue to worry anyways. <laughs> That's the problem. So is there anything we can do? Well, Jesus and James teach us valuable lessons about worry that show us that worry is not a requirement of life. Worry is not a requirement. It doesn't have to be in our life. You know, people say, well, worry is a normal part of life. No. Focused attention, that's a normal part of life. Worry, that's an aberration. Just like cancer, you know? yeah, people get cancer, but it's not a normal part of life. You know? So let's open a Matthew chapter six, if you have your Bibles, otherwise I'm just putting the slide up here. Let's read Matthew six, a very familiar passage, but I think it's worth just you know, reading the words again. Jesus says, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life. Do we understand that? Do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Don't worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Notice, he doesn't say, don't worry because there won't be any trouble. <laughs> he guarantees you that there's going to be trouble. He says, focus on today, today's trouble. Don't you be investing your emotional and spiritual energy into focusing into tomorrow's trouble, because then you won't have anything left to deal with today's trouble. We've talked, that, we've talked about that before. Notice that in this passage, Jesus deals head on with the problem of worry, which suggests that stress caused by worry is not just a 21st century problem. If he's teaching this, it means that those people there were having the same kind of worry issues that we're having today. Isn't that amazing? It was such a different culture, a different society, a different everything, language, finances, education, everything was different and yet this passage here could be, is spoke, speaks to us exactly as it spoke to them at that time. So Jesus gives us the correct perspective on worry as well as an alternative action. So in dealing with worry, here's you know, the things that he's telling us, if we can discern from this. The first thing we need is a correct perspective. Now the new perspective that Jesus is offering here is found in verses 25 to 32 that I've just read. And basically, basically it's this. Here's the, here's the, not the new perspective, the correct perspective. The correct perspective is that we need to understand that God knows exactly what it is that you need in every area of your life. That's the correct perspective. Whether it be food, 
or clothing or work or housing or sex or medical help or family or recreation, so on and so forth, God knows, God cares, and God can provide everything that you need. That's the correct perspective. Notice he goes out of his way to say, for these things the Gentiles eagerly seek after. You know, non-believers, they're all about house, car, food, getting up, taking care of myself. You know, they're all about that, he says. But don't you be like that. When we look into the future and we begin to worry about having the wherewithal to finish the job, or provide for our family, or the strength to face illness and death, we're taking on a responsibility that belongs to God. That's why worry is so heavy. <laughs> it doesn't belong to us. <laughs> we have no right to carry it. We're taking it from God and putting it on to ourselves. That's why it weighs so much. He is responsible for the future. And He has promised to provide the resources to meet that future, but only when it comes. As human beings, we're saying to Him, hey, I believe that you're going to provide. Could I have a little down payment today? You know, a little seed money, a little sum sum now, make me feel okay? And He says, no, <laughs> you only get it when you get there. So, I can be attentive to the future, absolutely. I can prepare for the future, absolutely. We, we encourage our children, right? Get a good education, stay in school, you know, prepare for the future, that's, that's, what, that's wisdom. I can be hopeful about the future, that things go well and, you know, and so on, and pray that you know, health will be good and kids will behave. I can do all of those things. But to worry about it is not only futile, it's sinful, because Jesus says, do not worry, verse 25. So once we have a correct perspective, you know, verse 34, the correct perspective is using today's resources to take care of today's needs, because God always provides enough today for today for today. That's the correct perspective. You're a worried person, worry gets to you, what do you do? Begin cultivating in yourself the correct perspective. I'm taking care of business today, God will give me what I need today. If I don't have something, then somehow I'm going to manage to get by without it today. The second thing, that we need is an attitude shift. Verse 33, for those who are overstressed, the major attitude in their lives is usually that of worry about the past, especially about the future. So Jesus explains how things are in the real world. And remember, the real world is not the world of politics and entertainment, that's not the real world. The real world is the kingdom of God on earth. That's actually the real world. You know, the Hollywood, the Kardashians, the Trump mobile, Iran, that's not the real world, that's the physical world. The real world, the world that will never be destroyed, the world that God has created for us is the kingdom of God. That's the real world. Okay. And so Jesus explains how things are in the real world. And how are things in the real world? Well, God supplies what we need one day at a time. That's how things are in the real world. If you don't know this, then you worry about having enough and you worry about being okay, and you worry about surviving in the home or work or society or whatever, because you're the one that has to make it happen. <laughs> it's on you. But once you've presented with this fact about God and His providence, 
your attitude needs to shift from worry to faith. And your lifestyle needs to shift from, listen, your lifestyle needs to shift from acquisition to righteousness. Let me explain. We worry because we think we are responsible for providing everything and in this world that's a pretty scary thought because so many people fail at that. So we focus on acquiring and stockpiling so that we'll be able to feel safe and secure. And this attitude and this activity creates worry which produces overstress which leads to burnout. Got that? So to avoid the overstress that comes from worry, we need to concentrate on God's promise to provide each day what we need on that particular day and change the focus of our lives from creating and maintaining wealth to creating and maintaining a pure conscience before God. Because that is the true work of a Christian, doing God's will. What do you think he means by seek first the kingdom? He means find out what it is that God wants from you and do that. <laughs> that's your work. That's, that's the heavy lifting in your life. Not acquiring stuff. That's not your life. That's like you're here. You got to do that. We got to eat. You know? They want money. So I go to the plant and I make the money and I give the money to the guy. The guy gives me bread. You know, yeah, sure. But that's not what I'm about. That's not what my emotional and spiritual energy is invested in. My emotional and spiritual energy is invested in knowing what God wants from me. And I don't just mean going out and knocking on doors and telling people about Jesus, although that's okay. Maybe He just wants me to focus so that I learn something about Him. Maybe he's putting me through a, a situation in my life so I'm going to discover how merciful he is or how just he is or how pure he is. My job as a Christian is to get to know God and to get to know what he wants me to do, how he wants me to act. Sometimes it's not just, I'm going to do some great thing where people are going to say, whoa, you're a great, no, no, no. Sometimes how He wants you to act is how He wants you to deal with an insult by someone you work with. And so your work, your real work is how are you going to deal with the insult from someone at work? There's your work. There's the real world. Now you still have to do your job and stamp the invoices and put the in the inbox and in the outbox and you know, put in your, sure, of course. But that isn't your real work. This is your real work. How am I going to reconcile with this person? That's my real work. Why? Because I'm in the real world. I live in the kingdom. This means that we will have the normal stress that comes with working at the challenges that face us each day, like everybody else, but avoiding the overstress that comes with either the concern that we have to be alone to provide uh, or the worry over the non-existent concerns of tomorrow. Because I live in the real world, I'm not thinking about tomorrow because, because my attitude is God promised that He's going to provide what I need tomorrow so I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to worry about that. I'll stay focused because I want to take care of my business, but you know what? I want to take care of my business because Christians take care of their business. <laughs> they don't show up late for work three out of five days. They don't, they don't drink on the job. You know what I'm saying? We don't do that. We're good employees. We're good bosses. We're fair supervisors. We give, you know, whoever hires us has hired a good thing. They're getting their money's worth when they hire us. Yeah. So let's go even further. A correct perspective, an attitude shift, 
the shift of attitude is instead of acquiring and hoarding to provide my security so that I won't worry, which simply creates more worry, the attitude shift to my work is righteousness. My work is knowing God. My work is knowing what God wants me to do in every situation. That's two. And then three, converting stress and worry to joy. Converting stress and worry into joy. That's the third thing. So this is James' James's approach. James' approach to worry and stretch, uh, stress is to demonstrate that even negative things that happen to us don't have to create worry and consequently overstress and all of the negative things that come from overstress. So let's read James chapter uh, one, verses two to four. So here, again, two very familiar passages. So James says, uh, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So in verses two to four, James explains how to short circuit worry and its negative effects. He says the way you do this is you understand that when trials, and these could include physical things, temptations, disappointments, those are all trials. When trials come your way, understand that they can be the cause of some good in your life. Now if one meets them with perseverance, perseverance is patience. You know when they say be patient. Patience is the quality and virtue of patience is the willingness to bear under. You know, when somebody says, uh, are you, can you be patient? Yeah, what, what does it mean to be patient? You know, some people say, well, I'm patient. Come on, hurry up, let's go. I've been here five minutes, now let's, let's move it along here. You know, and they say, well, I'm being patient. You know, no, no, patience isn't just waiting around. Patience is the willingness to wait, the willingness to put up with incompetence, the willingness to put up with incompetence by other people without losing your bearing, the willingness to put up with waste, the willingness to put up with unkindness, the willingness to put up with time when something that should have taken two days is now taken two weeks, the willingness to put up with that without losing your Christian bearing. That's what patience is. Okay. So if one meets the trials of life, according to James, with patience, then the constant perseverance mode, you know, it's like you have a switch and sometimes you're meeting a trial and how will I react? <laughs> my job, remember, my job is I'm here to, to find what is you know, God's will. What is God's will? as far as me reacting to this situation here. Oh, God's will is that I switch on the perseverance switch. The patience switch clicks on, which means I'm willing to bear under and wait as long as it takes to take care of this or to work at this until I solve it or to whatever, okay? And so the constant perseverance mode in us will eventually produce a mature character, and experiencing this mature character will create in us peace and joy and love and patience and kindness. All of these experiences will become a joyful thing for us. The thing is, we want the peace and the love and the patience and the kindness. We want all of these things created in us without any pain, <laughs> and that's not possible. Those things are created in us through fire, through trial. So you know, don't you love it when you can be patient through something and just wait it through and not lose your bearing, then the, the thing finally comes about and you're able to say, thank you Lord, thank you for finally, this has finally come through for me, I appreciate it. And you look back at your conduct during that period of time, whether it's a day or a week or a month, and you say, you know what, that was pretty good. 
No cursing, no swearing, no whining, no feeling sorry for myself, no blaming other people, no shaking my fist at God. I just hung in there and I waited for it and I believed He would give it to me and He did. I'm feeling good, I'm feeling joyful, I'm feeling confident, I'm feeling hopeful. Wholeness, maturity is what our spirit craves for, whether we realize it or not. Unfortunately, we're usually distracted by the things of this world. We're usually distracted by the, 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 the task of hoarding and collecting and, and taking care of ourselves. We have no time for this spiritual cultivation. It takes time. So he says in verse five, he continues, he says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it'll be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So in these verses, he explains that doing this is not always easy. And so if one desires to do this and has problems, he should ask God for help and do so with faith, knowing that God who provides for each day's needs will also provide spiritual help for everyday challenges. I don't know how strong I, I could be if one of my grandchildren were deathly ill, or if some drunk driver hit one of my babies? I don't know how strong I would be. I have no idea. I, I mean, if I think of it today, I think I'd collapse. I'd be good for nothing. But I, I can't know that unless that happens on that day. And on that day, that's the day I'll say, okay, God. <laughs> You have to hold me up. He won't give me that today, because that hasn't happened today. But I have to have the confidence that he'd give it to me on the day that I needed it. Just like he'd give it to you on the day you needed it too. So many times we, we won't quit a bad habit or we won't attempt to give up a sin which is blocking our spiritual growth because we feel that we'll never be able to bear an entire lifetime without it. I remember, I always, I use this as an example because I was a smoker for many, many years, you know, and the thought of me quitting smoking, the problem was, it wasn't health related. I could care less about the health. I love to smoke. The, the thought was, I will never again inhale the smoke. Never. If I give up, that means never in my life will I click, click. <sighs> Ooh, that's good. That'll never happen to me again. And that thought was the thing that was holding me back until I, I understood this here. I only have to quit for today. I don't know about tomorrow. I could be dead tomorrow. Today, He'll give me the strength to do it today. Tomorrow's another day and I'll ask for the strength. That's how I quit. According to the scriptures we're just, that we've just studied, we should get help for only today and we will get help for today. And tomorrow God will provide the help we need for tomorrow's temptation if we still need it. The same strategy works for the help we need to develop our talents, reach our goals, convert our family and friends, so on and so forth. So James tells us that trials don't have to be an enemy, producing not only pain and inconvenience, but also causing us to worry and producing you know, damaging stress in our lives. No, trials, he says, can be used to develop the spiritual maturity that we need and desire, and which will result in peace and joy. And knowing this, short circuits the worry caused by the trial. It's like what I do, I call it. You know what I'm saying? I call it. Like if I'm in the day and something happens, it'll be like, okay, 
I know what's happening here. Now here's, this is my trial for today, or whatever that is, but I mean, I call it. Okay. All right, it started. You know, the devil threw it down. All right, it's on. Let's do it. You know, like I call it. And I use what I know to deal with it. So the stress that comes from our worry caused by two things, let me kind of wrap up here. We worry about the responsibility to provide for ourselves. And then we worry when trials interfere with our efforts to acquire and hoard in order to provide for ourselves, which we think will make us happy. The Lord and His earthly brother James provides the answer for those who are stressed out because of worry. Two things, remember, God will supply what we need each day when we focus our attention on doing His will rather than just acquiring and hoarding. And then secondly, we shouldn't worry about the suffering brought about by trials. We should invest our energy into perseverance when we suffer. You know when I say, okay, it's on. Okay, this is the trial, this is what's happening. The, the perseverance, it looks like I'm going to have to flip on the perseverance switch and I flip that thing on. If we worry, it'll make the suffering worse and accomplish nothing. If we choose to persevere, however, it will create in us a greater maturity and joy which will help us to endure the pain, lower the stress level caused by the pain. And just one last thing, of course there'll be things that will happen in our lives, of course. He didn't say nothing will ever happen to you to cause you stress or worry or pain. He's just telling you when that happens, remember that I'll be there to help provide for your needs. Okay, a lot more we can say about that, but we're going to have to cut it short here.